Um, yes. Hello, Hello. 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 if we can ask. Good morning. I, I think if we can ask everybody to uh, please mute their systems, their phones, that would be uh, most appreciated. And I and let me uh, uh, offer a good afternoon, you know, to those who are joining from the kingdom or elsewhere in the region. And good morning uh, to those who are tuning in from here in the United States. Uh, a really early morning, I have to say, to uh, Samir Khalil on the West Coast uh, there in, in San Diego. So it's truly a morning morning. Uh, it's a manageable hour here at 9 a.m. in Washington. So uh, again, uh, thank you all for taking the time out of what I know are busy days to be with us, you know, in this remote environment. I know um, there's a lot of different uh, events going on. So we appreciate people taking time uh, to tune in and, and join into this discussion uh, today. Um, I'm Steve Lutz, uh, Vice President for Middle East Affairs at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. I'm uh, joined by my colleague, uh, somebody who I think uh, most of you see uh, and uh, get emails from uh, Liz Clark, uh, Senior Manager for Middle East, who's actually tuning in uh, while on vacation uh, to be with us today. And the U.S. Chamber is delighted to be partnering uh, with the Ministry of Investment in Saudi Arabia uh, on this three-part webinar series looking at the healthcare system in the kingdom. Uh, it's part of a larger series uh, that we're doing with the ministry following our U.S. Saudi Arabia Virtual Business Leaders Forum that we did earlier this year. And many of you may also recall that last year we also partnered with the ministry uh, on a sectoral webinar series that did include uh, life sciences uh, and the, the medical technology sectors. Uh, to kick off this series, we will start to today with webinar one and a focus on priorities in healthcare and life sciences in the kingdom. Uh, that will be followed on August 22nd. Uh, by webinar two, which will explore uh, clinical research and personalized medicine uh, in Saudi Arabia. And then we'll wrap things up and conclude the series on October 13 uh, with webinar three, looking at the intersection of healthcare and data in Saudi's healthcare infrastructure. Um, let me first, I also want to acknowledge and thank uh, our sponsor AbbVie for their support of this series and active leadership of the overall healthcare bilateral relationship. And we'll hear from one of their leaders uh, later in this program. And I also wanna thank uh, the many members in the biopharmaceutical, medical device, health IT and insurance sectors uh, that are supportive of the Saudi program at the US Chamber. And uh, in addition, as you all know, uh, to the many events that we host, uh, there's a lot of issues that we're engaging on and working with our members and with the uh, intention to impact the business environment and operations and ultimately investment decisions for US companies in Saudi Arabia. And at the chamber, uh, we remain very committed to the bilateral economic relationship. And like so many of our mem member companies, we believe that there are vast opportunities for us to build on uh, in the years to come. And that's very much in alignment with Vision 2030, where a lot of those opportunities are in the knowledge-based sectors uh, with a focus on innovation and research, new technologies and human capital. And that really brings us to today's discussion. And for today, um, we're really delighted to begin with our Saudi leaders panel, uh, where we'll feature three experts. Uh, then we will follow that by turning to two leaders uh, in the private sector for their perspectives. And then finally, we'll reuse uh, any uh, remaining time for comments and questions uh, from participants. So with that, let me first uh, start things off by introducing uh, our three panelists, and we're really delighted and honored to have them with us. Uh, first, we'll hear from uh, Dr. Sarah Althari, a business development advisor at the Ministry of Investment. And I must say, Sarah's been a, a great partner in pulling uh, this webinar series together, as well as other activities. Uh, many of you may recall her uh, participating on a panel during our Saudi Business Leaders Forum earlier this year. And Dr. Sarah has been an advisor at the Ministry of investment since August of 2020. And in this capacity, she's responsible for promoting and facilitating investment opportunities in the kingdom in the healthcare and life sciences sectors. She previously worked uh, as a senior research manager at the MISC Foundation. And it's really important to note that she's a highly educated researcher. She holds a PhD 
in medical sciences with a focus on genetics from the University of Oxford. And Dr. Sarah worked as a visiting researcher at the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard as part of her doctoral residency and was a research assistant at the Harvard Medical School uh, where she was involved in the developmental uh, genome project. And she started out with a bachelor's degree in biological sciences and anthropology from Wesley College. And we look forward to hearing uh, Dr. Sarah's remarks. She will be followed by Professor uh, Ziad Memish. Uh, Dr. Memish currently is serving as a senior consultant in infectious diseases and director of research in the Innovation Center at the King Saud Medical City uh, for the Ministry of Health. He's also a professor at the College of Medicine at the Al-Faisaliyah University in Riyadh and an adjunct professor in the Hubert Development Global Health at the Rollins School of Public Health at Emory University in Georgia. Uh, professor Memish obtained his MD from the University of Ottawa in Canada in 1987, and he's board certified by the American Board of Internal Medicine, the American Board of Infectious Diseases, as well as a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians and the American College of Physicians. He's widely recognized as a pioneer in the mass gathering medicine and infection control. And he established the WHO Collaboration Center for Mass Gathering Medicine in the Ministry of Health and WHO Collaborating Center for Infection Control in, the Sa in Saudi's Ministry of National Guard uh, for Health Affairs. Dr. Memish was the first deputy minister of Health for Public Health in Saudi Arabia from 2009 to 2014. He also sits on many WHO advisory panels and on the national level, he is chair of the National Scientific Advisory Group for COVID-19 and chair of the Technical Advisory Group of COVID-19 vaccine under the Royal Court. And Dr. Memish, we really look forward to hearing from you as well. And then third in that lineup, we're very delighted to have with us uh, Dr. Abdullah uh, Adlan, uh, Dr. Abdullah, is the Executive Director of Ethics and Compliance at the Saudi National Institute of Health. He is also the Chairman of National Clinical Ethics and Committee and the Chairman of the National Committee of the Bioethical Guidelines of Providing Clinical Services and Scarce Resources. Uh, Dr. Abdullah is also Deputy Chairman of the National Committee of Research Data Transferability and serves as a of both the Saudi Health Council and the National Committee of Bioethics. He has a PhD in biomedical ethics from the University of Birmingham and a PhD in biomedical science from Bradford. So we really have, uh, truly have three great experts and we look forward to their remarks. Uh, Dr. Sarah, let me turn to you first and then we'll go to Dr. Memish. Dr. Sarah, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much, Steve, and thanks to, to the Chamber team for, for organizing this. It's, it's always a pleasure working with you all, and I'm really honored and delighted um, uh, to be with you today and to be speaking alongside uh, these giants in, in our field, Dr. Ziad and Dr. Abdullah, and of course our, our esteemed partners in, in industry. Uh, so thanks for the opportunity. Um, I think, you know, it's difficult to have a conversation nowadays about the healthcare sector without highlighting how much the coronavirus pandemic has really shifted the paradigm for, for everyone. Um, and you talked about shifting priorities, uh, strategic realignment. Uh, you know, it's led us to this really um, uh, uh, poignant moment of, of deep introspection uh, and reassessment and self-reflection for us as governments and nations about how we should strategically view and approach and promote the medical biotechnology sector and the healthcare sectors uh, uh, in our respective uh, countries. Um, and, and of course, you know, we all know that the healthcare sector is one of the most significant sectors for the kingdom uh, uh, with uh, an allocated government budget of over $40 billion. And, and the ambitions in the advent of, of Saudi Vision 2030, the size of our economy, our geostrategic location, and of course, our stature in both the Islamic and Arab worlds uh, means that we have a responsibility to enable uh, efficient healthcare solutions to broader populations. But also locally, uh, our population is very unique um, and lends itself to a lot of exciting and interesting cutting edge research. Uh, it's unique in terms of our ethnic composition, our disease profiles, and, our, and also our genomic uh, architecture. Uh, and, and this is really fertile ground for 
um, you know, the generation of unique and valuable uh, data sets that are potentially rich with uh, therapeutic breakthroughs and, and biological discoveries. And, and indeed, decades of, of investment in our healthcare infrastructure, uh, uh, which as, as folks who are, who are based here and who have worked here know is, is, is very strong and, and impressive. Um, uh, and the technologies and clinical research that we have have positioned the kingdom uh, as a regional leader in healthcare as measured by, by clinical outcomes and a core market for industry. But I think there are still many challenges that remain uh, and a host of new ones have surfaced in response to uh, um, the, the demographic trends uh, and shifts in disease profiles, emerging national health security threats and, and public health demands, uh, such as we've seen with, with COVID-19. Um, so for us as a Ministry of Investment, and uh, particularly the healthcare and life sciences sector, you know, what does this mean? Uh, we are committed to moving at the pace of global innovation at the Ministry of Investment. Uh, it is Saudi Arabia's broader ambition for the biomedical science industry uh, to, uh, you know, enhance and enable and empower areas like clinical research and personalized medicine, uh, biological therapeutics and, and genomic data analysis. These are the things that we are bullish on and that we really want to capitalize on in terms of growth and investment opportunities. Of course, we have, like I mentioned, a collective responsibility towards contributing to diagnostic and therapeutic breakthroughs, both regionally and globally, and ensuring the scalability of these breakthroughs, their distribution and access through global biomedical supply chains, as has been the, the, the case and the key discussion uh, around COVID-19 uh, uh, vaccines. And so, you know, from a strategic planning perspective, I think we're, we're in a strong position to leapfrog uh, legacy systems and transcend conventional technology and jump into innovative emerging technological solutions, jump into the cutting edge uh, of the field. And, and this is what we plan to do. We plan to dive directly uh, in, into those trends rather than play catch up with potentially some trends that we have uh, missed along, uh, uh, that, along the road. And so for these reasons and more, and, and many of you who have uh, potentially attended the, the, uh, the business forum that Steve mentioned earlier, have heard, um, have heard us say as a Ministry of Investment that we uh, are approaching the sector through a value chain-based lens, which is looking at the entire value chain of the sector from R&D to manufacturing and distribution to clinical care, as our industry partners have, have heard time and time again, and to really understand along that value chain from uh, you know, early drug discovery and basic science uh, all the way to clinical trials and then scale up manufacturing for those trials as well and, and, and achieving economies of scale in, in a high tech fashion through, through manufacturing and industry 4.0 until ultimately the products and drugs and softwares that we research make it to the clinic and, and make it to the patients. We're trying to understand and, and map out very strategically what the investment opportunities there are what are our inherent competitive advantages as a country and what we have to offer as a value proposition? Um, you know, where we should be bullish and where should we should be bearish? What trends do we need to, uh, uh, um, you know, embody and catch up with and transcend? And what, what trends do we think, you know, based on all of the things I just mentioned, we don't need to kind of have strategic plays in. Um, and as we assess, and as, as we assess all of those different parameters and factors along the value chain, we also want to make sure that we develop and build a robust infrastructure for the sector um, that will eventually be able to, to, to lift itself, right? So um, all of the opportunities that we plan, you know, within, within R&D, whether it's building biomedical research clusters or research and technology parks and commercializing uh, our genomics research and capitalizing on our genomic architecture and and running clinical trials for, for rare diseases that are enriched in our population to the different high-tech trends in, in manufacturing uh, um, and industry 4.0 and, and exploring concepts like CDMO regionally, uh, developing CDMOs and multimodality facilities uh, to, to, to cater to the region, all the way to innovative healthcare solutions. All of these things will not be possible without um, making sure that we have favorable policies and regulations and a regulatory environment that is hospitable and welcoming to innovative biopharma. Uh, we need to make sure that we have access to diverse 
pools of private public capital that can sustain the sector. Uh, we want to increase and improve the quality of, of human and intellectual capital in medical biotechnology and in healthcare and, 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 and these fields. Uh, like I said, the, the regulations and the legislative frameworks that we adopt need to uh, go hand in hand and in line with international gold standards, whether that's on intellectual property legislation, uh, the way that we uh, evaluate and approve drugs and clinical trials, things like price protection and, and, a, and a whole host of various um, regulatory uh, considerations. Uh, as a Ministry of Investment, we are keen to, of course, develop an a la carte portfolio of incentives along the value chain, uh, things that entice folks to come and do cutting edge R&D here, uh, to come and set up or contract or operate manufacturing facilities, uh, and also to come into our clinics and, and undertake you know, precision diagnostics and be able to access patient data in meaningful ways to optimize uh, personalized medicine. Uh, we, we of course need, as part of this infrastructure, also a system of clarified accountabilities and responsibilities uh, so that it makes it easy for folks who want to come in and innovate from startups to large MNCs to understand who to interface with and who their different enablers are in the government and the public sector ecosystem along the investment life cycle and the investment journey. And then of course, to enhance with our partners, a cultural awareness and appreciation for uh, innovation and the value of knowledge creation as we transition from being you know, an oil dependent economy to, to a knowledge based one per, per Vision 2030 ambitions. Um, you know, I can, I can go on for days and talk to you about the different uh, ambitions and objectives that we want to achieve for the sector, but I want to spend the time that I have left to talk to you about what we've already done um, uh, in, in, in the short period of time uh, that, that we've uh, been, been, been experiencing the strategic realignment within MISA as a result of COVID and what COVID has, has brought on um, in terms of shifting priorities. Um, for us, we are uh, focused on two main uh, tracks in parallel. One is a, is, a, is a, or the first track is a series of really robust policy reform initiatives that we're doing in collaboration with uh, our partners in industry, uh, as well as uh, all of the different local ecosystem stakeholders uh, who are involved in, in the different regulatory priorities and concerns that, 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 that we aim to, to reform. Uh, and then on the, on the other hand, um, we've uh, been able to send, uh, I think through this new strategic uh, approach, uh, really strong uh, positive signals to innovative biopharma um, that we are a welcoming home and hub in the region. And what this has meant is that it has uh, set the stage for some really exciting uh, uh, comprehensive partnerships and cooperation frameworks that we've been able to strike with with some of our partners, um, and I'll give and I'll give a few examples there. But I want to start with the first track, which is the policy reform initiatives, uh, and, and just talk about how um, you know we are in the business of of ecosystem enhancement to enable all of the investment opportunities that I that I described. And so for us, you know, we have a list of regulatory priorities. Um, uh, three kind of came to the forefront of, of, of the issues that we wanted to tackle at the, at the very outset with our industry partners, and these were related to intellectual property legislation, clinical trials, and data legislation governance and standards. Some efforts uh, are more mature than others. Uh, some are already, in fact, very near completion, like our intellectual property uh, initiative. Um, so, for example, with intellectual property, uh, we have partnered with, uh, and I know Ashraf and Samir are with us, the, the pharma group, um, uh, uh, as well as uh, the World Bank and uh, various legal partners of, of MISA to really um, review our intellectual property landscape, our legislative landscape, uh, review our trade articles, and undertake really rigorous uh, benchmarking with countries that have uh, mature kind of gold standard systems, but also countries that have experienced the transition that we would like to undergo at the present moment and understand, you know, uh, what models we can implement and adopt in our uh, legislation or enforcement or implementation in the context of IP in, in the pharmaceutical industry. And what we've done is we've, we've assessed 
the four key parameters, data exclusivity, data protection, patent term restoration, and compulsory, compulsory, compulsory licensing. And we've compared these with countries like South Korea and Singapore and Japan and the US and the UK uh, uh, and some of our other um, uh, uh, you know, neighboring regional countries as well, and have come up with very concrete and actionable policy recommendations uh, that we've socialized and circulated with our, with our friends and partners at the Saudi FDA, the Ministry of Health, the Saudi Authority for Intellectual Property. And we will continue to, to, to push for and lobby for some of these uh, uh, policy recommendations to be, to be implemented uh, uh, and give rise to true reform in the IP landscape uh, for pharma. And what we've done with the pharma group also is put co-author with them uh, a, a, um, an, an, what we call an investor advocacy piece, where we've highlighted the key concerns and the recommendations uh, um, or the, impl the implications for the current status quo on the investment ecosystem and, and climate. For clinical trials, we've also uh, built what we call a clinical trials coalition, and Dr. Ziad and Dr. Abdullah are va very valued members of this of this coalition with a, a, a host of other ecosystem stakeholders that is being co-led by uh, four, four uh, industry partners with us who are who represent the research-based pharmaceutical community in, in the kingdom and in the region. Uh, and we've been able to take this work to a stage where we are evaluating a clinical trials business model uh, in agreement with industry and all of these uh, ecosystem stakeholders for what the national unified clinical trials business model should look like across the country in terms of ethical review, scientific review, submission, sponsorship, and all of the different elements that go into that to that business model. Um, and then finally, we are also embarking on a uh, uh, on a data reform uh, uh, policy initiative with with industry partners as well. Uh, and folks like the Saudi Health Council and the Saudi Authority for Data and Artificial Intelligence to really understand how we can optimize our policies for uh, precision diagnostics and personalized healthcare solutions uh, in clinic. And these uh, are things like, you know, data access and management and storage uh, um, and, and other priorities. Um, we, we're, we are um, also built in the process of building a number of other coalitions and initiatives around cell therapy and how we can localize a cell therapy hub end-to-end R&D material access and issues related to logistics and importation. So we're really trying to tackle all of the different issues that will enable us to build that robust foundation that I described earlier. But we've also been able to collaborate with industry partners. And I'll give the example of, of, of Roche because we recently signed our memorandum of understanding with them in February, which is this comprehensive partnership framework around investment opportunities that include localization of, of, of uh, manufacturing of biologics for certain product lines. It includes the integration of value-based healthcare solutions in our ecosystem. There are also elements around training and capability building from everywhere from healthcare journalism all the way to, uh, to basic research. Uh, it also includes the policy work that we've described and the participation in, of, of, in, of MISA in private public partnerships that Roche has built with uh, 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 multi-industry consortia and how we can come up with interdisciplinary solutions uh, for the healthcare ecosystem. Um, and so I just wanted to give you all an overview of, of you know, where we stand in terms of partnerships, signals we're sending, infrastructure that we are building to make sure that we can capitalize on our uh, value proposition uh, on the R&D segment of the value chain that has been neglected for so long in the kingdom uh, and make sure that we go about investment opportunities uh, uh, and engagements on policy reform and other intangible uh, uh, kind of impact initiatives with our industry partners in a very collaborative and, and cohesive way. So with that and without taking too much time from, from the other panelists, I'd like to thank you all uh, and I'm happy to take questions uh, uh, afterwards, but I'll now hand it over to uh, my colleague and friend, Dr. Ziad. Thank you, Dr. Sara. It's going to be hard to, to follow um, your presentation. Um, I think what I was uh, going to address is the, uh, the issue of, of mass gathering uh, events and how that uh, has been impacted by the uh, the COVID outbreak uh, since 2000, uh, 2020 last year, 
and uh, uh, to build on uh, the expertise that the kingdom has has gained over the years uh, in dealing in, in mass gathering events. I'm sure all of you are aware of the uh, challenges facing uh, Japan in, in uh, holding the Olympics and Paralympics in, uh, in July next month. A lot of debates about uh, accepting uh, 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 teams from across the world and also spectators uh, without vaccine, uh, which is causing a, a lot of uh, sort of uh, uh, questions in, in the media. Uh, we've recently uh, written a, a piece in uh, International Journal of Infectious Disease, uh, uh, a panel of experts from different countries across the globe saying that this probably will not be uh, acceptable these days, knowing that the vaccine is available, uh, it's extremely effective, uh, and, and uh, some of the companies have actually donated some of the doses to the teams uh, uh, attending the um, the Olympic Games, but uh, uh, apparently the uh, Japanese government has decided to proceed without uh, requiring the vaccine to be given to the to the team uh, participating in the in the uh, in the Olympics. So to build on this, uh, we have uh, you know I've had the pleasure of working uh, during the Hajj uh, for at least uh, twenty years. Um, you know, initially I was working as a researcher who used to sort of. Uh, uh, go and, and uh, collect samples, uh, you know, uh, in the National Guard facilities, healthcare facilities uh, at the Hajj premises. And then uh, later on, I had the, the honor and privilege of overseeing the Hajj as the Deputy Minister of Public Health, uh, which was an unbelievable honor and, and, a, and a privilege. Uh, and uh, certainly I have learned uh, a huge amount of knowledge uh, in my few years uh, in, in coordinating uh, the activities that is done on a on a national scale, it's not one person show. It's it's the whole kingdom that actually uh, works very hard on on managing the uh, the Umrah and Hajj. And as you probably uh, well aware, uh, Vision 2030 uh, has actually had uh, increase in the number of Umrah uh, pilgrims uh, from uh, six million to 30 million in 2030, and increasing the pilgrims for the Hajj from two million to six million in 2030. And unfortunately, this uh, COVID uh, hit us all by surprise, and and uh, the numbers have gone down to 1,000 last year uh, for the Hajj, and, and this year, as you probably heard, uh, the recent announcement from the government just a few days ago that they will be accepting 60,000 pilgrims uh, for this Hajj. So I, th I thought it would be nice to go through uh, the challenges that are faced by uh, the kingdom and and the uh, the authorities dealing with the Hajj. Uh, I guess the, the Ministry of Health takes the biggest uh, chunk of uh, responsibility for healthcare, uh, but uh, not on its own. You know, it works with this uh, civil defense, uh, with Ministry of Hajj, uh, Ministry of uh, Transportation. Almost every single ministry in the country uh, is involved during the uh, the process. Uh, take you quickly through uh, uh, what the kingdom has done over the last uh, 20, 30 years with different emerging pandemics and epidemics. Um, uh, and also uh, discuss what happened in Hajj uh, 2020 with the COVID and then the plans for this year's Hajj and then hopefully uh, close with the uh, conclusions and take home messages. Um, you know, we know that over the last uh, 10 years or so, the number of emerging infectious diseases has actually increased significantly. Almost 95% of these emerging diseases are actually zoonotic diseases and they come to us from animals. Uh, these viruses go through a lot of changes and they adapt themselves to infect humans and then eventually they become a human uh, viruses and they tend to spread easily between humans. Uh, WHO decided in 2018 to call the experts around the table and discuss what would be the 10 most likely pathogens that would be causing pandemics in the future uh, and the experts agree on these uh, this 10 uh, uh, listed uh, viruses and diseases, and of course, uh, MERS and SARS were among these, uh, in addition to many others, including Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever, Ebola, Marburg, Lassa, uh, Nipah uh, fever, and uh, Rift Valley, and Zika. And of course, disease X, uh, which uh, basically attracted the attention of all the media uh, portals at that time. Uh, what was uh, this disease X that the WHO is worried about? And I think what we're seeing today with COVID is probably disease X. Uh, WHO thought that there would be a disease that would emerge that nobody had any immunity to before, uh, that the whole world will be susceptible to, and the disease will basically uh, uh, be rampant, uh, causing infection in large numbers of individuals, in the millions, and that's uh, what we have so far, 170 million people 
uh, have been infected with this COVID virus and the mortality is in, in, in the millions. Uh, so I think COVID would, would fit very nicely into this disease X uh, uh, phenomena, although WHO has worked very hard with all its partners to uh, build capacities and be prepared for this. Uh, I don't think we're even close to being prepared. And, and I'm sure uh, most of you have seen uh, the nice article written by uh, uh, Dr. Ann Schultz from uh, the CDC uh, in New York Times uh, three days ago, where basically said even now, uh, she doesn't think that the, the US is prepared uh, for another pandemic uh, happening anytime soon. Uh, and I'll be happy to share the link to that uh, article. Uh, which I think is, is very interesting. I don't think any of the countries in the world are, are actually uh, prepared. And I think that's why at the last G7 meeting in, in Cornwall, uh, the, the leaders of the seven uh, countries have decided that uh, they're working on a 100-day uh, document, which basically states that, uh, uh, that uh, in the future pandemics, uh, the world commits to being ready uh, in 100 days in making uh, diagnostics, therapeutics, and vaccine. Uh, and this uh, initiative is, is basically uh, led by the UK uh, senior advisor and also by uh, Melinda Gates. Uh, so so I, I mentioned zoonotic uh, origin, and that usually comes to us from uh, different animals uh, uh, through uh, mosquitoes or uh, through different uh, portals and into the, into the humans, and they become uh, easily spread between, uh, between humans. Uh, when you look at the uh, at the Hajj, I joined the Ministry of Health with my uh, bad fortune in in, uh, in March 2009, and that was the year of the uh, H1N1 uh, pandemic. And I guess it wasn't a good year for me because uh, I, I just dived into the uh, managing the pandemic and the Umrah and Hajj that year. Uh, this is me just a, a year before uh, working as a scientist in in one of the uh, Hajj clinics uh, under the National Guard collecting. Uh, samples from people who are presenting with respiratory symptoms. And you can see I wasn't wearing a mask, which is a, a big mistake, but uh, we do all know people who work in the Hajj uh, every year like me for 20 years, uh, we know that we get flu at the time with the beginning of the Hajj, we get flu when the Hajj finishes and we get a flu before we go back to work. So we get three flus uh, every time uh, the Hajj uh, uh, happens. And at that time, working with my colleagues and researchers from the UK, we predicted uh, that uh, very soon we will have a pandemic from influenza uh, because we have a merging of uh, flu uh, isolates from different hemispheres, the southern and the northern hemisphere. Uh, and God forbid, we had that outbreak in 2009, it started in North America and Mexico and the US, and then uh, rapidly spread across the globe. And basically, uh, you know, we published this uh, nice report in science uh, saying that uh, based on the information that we have at that time that people should not be going to the Hajj uh, and attending mass gathering if they're older, if they have comorbidities or if they are pregnant and uh, they probably should delay the, uh, the Hajj until the year after and also recommended that the vaccine uh, be given to the pilgrims if the vaccine is made available on time before the Hajj. And of course, we worked very closely with our colleagues at WHO and, and produced this technical document uh, you know, basically describing what needs to be done uh, to prevent uh, that pandemic uh, from spreading. And, and luckily, that Hajj season was one of the most successful Hajj seasons uh, that we've had uh, in many years. Um, of course, MERS came in 2012, uh, just two weeks before uh, the Hajj season uh, actually uh, uh, started. Uh, it was a, an announcement in uh, ProMed uh, that came out on September 23rd uh, from Professor Ali Zeki saying that he has sent a sample to the uh, Netherlands and they discovered a new virus. And uh, this was actually an, a novel virus which was labeled as MERS-CoV at that time. Um, you know, we had two weeks to prepare uh, our pilgrims who already uh, departed to KSA to participate in the Hajj. Uh, we produced this uh, document very quickly through your surveillance uh, and making recommendations on uh, what needs to be done for that Hajj season. In addition to putting a case definition that would actually fit uh, what we need to be surveying for uh, during the Hajj premises. We worked very closely with the CDC, Public Health England, uh, European CDC in setting up our own labs in Jeddah and in Mecca uh, so that we can process samples very quickly. And we've linked up Public Health England to make sure that we uh, run uh, parallel testing uh, in KSA and in, in the UK to ensure that uh, we have accurate results until uh, the testing system was validated. All this happened within two to three weeks uh, just before the Hajj started. 
unbelievable stress. But again, uh, since then, uh, many years of, of Hajj, since the mers uh, has started in KSA mainly, and we have not had a single transmission during the Hajj uh, with mers -CoV. We did have uh, at least three or four transmissions uh, during the Umrah uh, from some pilgrims, but not uh, from the Hajj season uh, because of the rigorous uh, interventions that have been taken by the government of KSA. Of course, all of you are aware of the Ebola virus, uh, Ebola viral disease, which started in West Africa in 2014. Uh, again, uh, very rapidly increase in numbers of cases. Uh, Ministry of Health and KSA monitors on a daily basis what goes on as far as communicable disease across the globe. And based on its uh, uh, national committee that meets on regular basis, decides what needs to be done as far as interventions. Uh, these recommendations are usually raised uh, through the Minister of Health to the uh, Royal Cabinet, and then a decision is made on what interventions uh, will be taken. In that year specifically, uh, we looked at uh, the number of pilgrims coming to us from the West Africa. And as you can see, uh, Nigeria was the one that had the uh, highest numbers of pilgrims, but uh, there were no cases discovered in Nigeria at that time. So uh, there was a, a recommendation that people coming to us from Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Guyana would be uh, not allowed to come for the Hajj in that year, but they will be compensated with extra visas uh, the, the years after. And that's what the uh, Kingdom has recommended uh, based on the National Committee uh, recommendation. Zika virus uh, came in 2016, a very devastating disease affecting newborns, causing major uh, neurological deficit. A huge concern for us in the kingdom because we do have the mosquito that transmits the virus uh, and also as you know pilgrims uh, that comes uh, to perform the hajj wear the ihram which is uh, the towels uh, which leaves a lot of areas of the body exposed to mosquito bites uh, a lot of work has been done by the ministry of health and environmental services to try to uh, eradicate the mosquitoes at the Hajj premises. And luckily, no cases of Zika uh, were reported in 2016. And of course, we come to the COVID, uh, which took us all by surprise, uh, first announced in, in January uh, 2020. I'm also fortunate to be on the uh, WHO IHR Emergency Committee representing our region. Uh, uh, of course, our first cases in KSA were diagnosed uh, at the uh, uh, coming through the uh, uh, border from Bahrain, uh, arriving from Iran. And uh, since then, of course, uh, all the uh, entry into the kingdom was actually locked down and then no Umrah uh, was allowed. And then eventually uh, the mosques in Mecca and Medina were actually uh, locked and, and nobody was allowed to go in there. Uh, and that was the first year that the Umrah actually was uh, put on hold or suspended uh, because of the high risk of transmission uh, so early in the disease uh, discovery and also a lot of information not known about therapeutics and diagnostics and, and transmission mechanism. Uh, this is a, a unique uh, aerial picture of the uh, Grand Mosque, which is very unusual to see it empty at any uh, time. And I don't think anybody has seen it empty uh, until the time of the of the COVID. Uh, and this is the time of, of actually disinfecting the, the whole area around the mosque and also uh, the, uh, around the uh, Grand uh, uh, Kaaba and also uh, disinfecting the Kaaba uh, coverage. Uh, and this is just to show you the contrast between when it gets really busy uh, at the Umrah and Hajj and also uh, when it's uh, when it's actually uh, vacated to uh, to do the disinfection. Uh, of course, at that time, there was a, a work done by the Ministry of Health looking at the risk of uh, uh, allowing the Hajj to proceed in 2020. And of course, they've identified uh, this COVID virus to be a very high risk for transmission and spread to 140 countries uh, where pilgrims come to us from. Uh, so a decision was made uh, to uh, basically restrict the Hajj to uh, local uh, people within the country uh, to 1,000 individuals. Uh, a lot of uh, unique arrangements and, and public health interventions were put in place uh, where the pilgrims were guided by, uh, by escorts from public health. Uh, and also uh, they had very clear instructions on how to move and mobilize and ensure uh, safe distances between each other. Uh, of course, uh, PCR was done on the pilgrims and also all the people working at the uh, Hajj uh, season of that year. None of the pilgrims actually uh, came down with, uh, with COVID. And then again, uh, a few of the people working with the pilgrims came down with COVID, uh, but no, no mortality, uh, thank God. Uh, now for 2021, again, a lot of risk assessment was done by uh, the Ministry of Hajj in collaboration with all its partners, uh, uh, Ministry of Health, Ministry of Hajj, and also the Ministry of Interior. And a decision was made a few days ago by the Royal Court 
that uh, only 60,000 pilgrims will be allowed in total, uh, all from within the kingdom, 75% expatriates and 25% nationals. Uh, the age restrictions between 18 and 60 years of age, all vaccinated with two doses of approved vaccines, and the priority for pilgrims who are more than 50, no comorbidities, and they have never performed the Hajj. Uh, so I think uh, hopefully uh, uh, the arrangements that have been followed last year in, in organizing the Hajj will be followed this year, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm quite confident uh, in the knowledge and expertise that the Ministry of Health has in managing uh, the 60,000 pilgrims who are uh, going to be performing the Hajj in August this year. So in conclusion, uh, proceeding with Hajj 2020 and 2021 uh, will impose a religious sense of security for the Muslim community worldwide. Uh, the success of Hajj 2020 during COVID pandemic is a, a lesson uh, for all global entities. It requires a model for successfully planning, executing, managing mass gathering events using innovative technologies uh, in, uh, and then other uh, preventative measures that are proven to be uh, fairly effective. Uh, I'll, again, I'll stop here and maybe after uh, Dr. Abdullah uh, uh, finishes his uh, inter intervention, uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions uh, that uh, any of you would have. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very thank much. You. That was very interesting and we'll, we'll definitely uh, open it up for questions and, and delighted to have uh, uh, Dr. Abdullah with us. Uh, uh, doctor, we've, we've done kind of the, the formal introductions. So uh, I'll mention again for everybody's purposes, uh, Dr. Abdullah is the Executive Director of Ethics and Compliance uh, at the Saudi National Institute of Health. And uh, Dr. Abdullah, with that, we'll uh, turn to you for the, the final presentation on this panel. Thank you very much for the invitation. And uh, I hope that the future will be prosper for uh, both of the countries. Um, I'm, I'd like just to introduce what is the Saudi National Institute of Health uh, backgrounds. It's uh, inaugurated a few years ago, actually. The work has started four years ago with a group of ambitious people to transform the research in the kingdom from a scattered kind of uh, lonely islands that uh, habitat and uh, elitist hospitals to a culture that widespread among the hospitals and healthcare providers in Saudi Arabia. So what we have uh, trying to do uh, through the last uh, four years is to unify some sort of one code of uh, uh, research policies and research environment. We try to bring people together on one table, discuss the problems and uh, have the authoritative kind of upper hand to, uh, from the country to uh, fund research. The model is basically is to fund extramural research, not uh, intramural the way that the American NIH is, is doing. So uh, we deliberately wanted to take this decision and we yeah, wanted to enforce it because of uh, we want completely to support without any conflict of interest, without competing with the fund that we are going to receive from the kingdom or from anywhere and uh, be like uh, the person who has completely no interest and thus uh, have the authority to be as fair as it can it can be. The main four commitment of the uh, Saudi National Institute of Health is to fund high quality research to improve high and health and well-being of uh, of Saudi nationals and of course to, to the to the people of the world. Uh, cultivate environments that will enable research excellence and facilitate the translation of discoveries and knowledge into health and economic benefits, support research personnel at all stages of training and career developments, and all centralized and enhanced health, well-being, and economic property. Of course, we have cross-match with a lot of uh, partners, I would call them in Saudi Arabia, but we, went, we wanted to concentrate on solving problem in a proactive manner than, rather than reactive manner. To do, us, to do so, we came with an experience of research. Of course, we came from the, 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 the health ecosystem of Saudi Arabia, and we understand that uh, in research, we, there is some certain problems, and we wanted to uh, channel our old power and authority, the authority that we have from the uh, government towards solving these, these uh, problems. One of uh, the most actually important challenges that we are dealing is to habitat the clinical trial in Saudi Arabia. We know that 
uh, we have problems in this sector and uh, we are working hard with Dr. Sarah and a lot of uh, stakeholders to pave the way for a more ethical clinical trial to be uh, held in Saudi Arabia. Um, to give you an idea that uh, what, what has been done so far, uh, if you ask any uh, clinical trialist in the kingdom what's the major problem that they have, they would sacrifice or slow to write right away the first suspect, which is the time needed for, for, uh, for ethical review and scientific review. We acknowledge this fact and we uh, analyzed the problem and we found it root, root cause of, uh, uh, through root cause analysis and we are working hard to solve this by unifying the, the, the process, inviting the, 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 the pharma industry based on uh, knowledge that we have about the need of the Saudi population. If we, for example, have this X disease uh, uh, problem in Saudi Arabia, we would invite uh, pharma industry, whomever has the closest kind of solution in a trial period for this uh, problem that we have. This is an overarching idea. And to do their, their, the, the, the most important thing to the pharma industry as a business kind of people is time. So we are trying to work in a middle model to uh, provide them with an eight weeks uh, final answer review. And to do that, uh, a very heavy work uh, is going now, right now under the uh, spearhead of uh, Dr. Sara and we are in the NIH are, are invited to uh, take the, 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 the responsibility is to unify the process of review uh, based on the fact that if uh, the a national committee of bioethics and scientific review have seen a proposal. The hospital need just to uh, look into the logistics, the uh, kind of their their uh, patients' uh, interests would say, I would say, in terms of if they have enough number and, and so on and so forth. So this will hopefully minimize the time and uh, uh, reduce the wasted time in waiting for an official reviews from many uh, bodies. For example, the right now situation is the status quo says that if you want to have multi-central trial in, in, in Kingdom, you from three hospitals, you will have to go through the process with each and every uh, IRB and, and scientific committee of those three, three hospitals. What we are doing is to change that to make it a unified kind of review with four weeks of turnover time. We know this is kind of uh, ambitious uh, uh, kind of an ask, but with the support we have from the government, it is not uh, impossible. Dr. Sara is doing um, a magnificent work to, to be the way for that to happen. The consortium we have in the kingdom has full understanding of the gravity of the importance of uh, having uh, a clinical trial uh, industry comfortably in the most ethical and most governed way in Saudi Arabia. So uh, I think we are ready for close the chapter of uh, lousy reviews and long time of six months and even more uh, to toward the chapter of a few weeks or let's say eight, uh, eight weeks uh, uh, review process. And uh, this is from the part of clinical trial. The registries, we have a, a very strong alignment with uh, um, the SEDAIA, which is the authority body that would deal with the data in the kingdom. And with those, we are going to unify our uh, forces to make sure that tab into resources when it comes to research is very well uh, governed for the protection of our population not to be exploited, as well as to uh, improve healthcare in general in Saudi Arabia, as well as internationally, if, if uh, we could do that. Uh, the work is going through the hours 24 seven, and uh, we are ambitious to, uh, to share whatever we have to whomever is interested for uh, uh, building capacities and uh, share, share, uh, transforming uh, knowledge. And uh, um, we are actually knocking all the doors we can to uh, do it in the right manner. Uh, bottom line, I think what we have right now can be uh, enough to make the kingdom uh, among the few, uh, or let's say among the five, which is the, the, the top five clinical trial uh, houses or habitat in the Middle East within the coming few years.
Uh, thank you very much, and uh, I'm open to any question. Thank you, Dr. Bill. And uh, between the, the three of you, you've given us uh, so much. It's it's truly a comprehensive overview, uh, Dr. Sarah, from the vision and you know kind of post COVID the realignment there at the ministry and your two tracks of focus. Um, obviously, at the U.S. Chamber, our ears always perk up when we hear a discussion around policy reform. So, and I'm sure our, our, our next two panelists will will uh, want to talk about those. Uh, Dr. Ziad, um, your just knowledge and influence and expertise in the, the mass gatherings, we know obviously the, the UMRA and the Hajj are a priority for the kingdom. So all of your work and the example that it can set for other mass gatherings, I think is absolutely fascinating and looking at partnerships with industry. And then certainly uh, Dr. Adola, it's very interesting to hear, uh, this is the first time we at the chamber have had anybody from Saudi NIH uh, speak to our members. So it's great to hear about your four areas of focus and in particular, how you're working with uh, Dr. Sarah and others um, with respect, you know, to this this clinical research regime, and enhancing, you know, the, the process to get things reviewed and and shorten that to make, uh, to, as you said, to make it more a welcoming environment for the clinical trial. So we thank you for that. Before we open it up for questions um, and comments from the floor, I want to turn to our next two panelists, and really, they've been uh, great partners at the chamber. And uh, Samir Khalil, I think, is known to most on here. Uh, he's executive director for Middle East and Africa at the Pharmaceutical Research and Manufacturers of America, of course, known as Pharma. And uh, Samir has been, I have to say, a great partner of the chamber. Um, and we've been working with Samir, I know, for years um, in, in talking with uh, our members and our friends in the Saudi government um, about that, that investment environment. And I think uh, some of the, the messages from doctors are, are music to our ears, but we'll, we'll look to hear from you on that. And then we're also going to hear from uh, Ashraf Dawood, a generally man general manager in Saudi Arabia for Abvi Pharmaceuticals. And I have to say he also wears another hat as chairman of the local working group that, that Sarah referenced several times in terms of the engagement with industry. So uh, Samir, Ashraf, we look forward to hearing from you. And then uh, following your comments, then we'll, we will open it up for questions and, and comments from the floor. Samir, we'll turn it over to you. And thanks for joining us uh, right and early from San Diego. Thank you very much, Steve. It's, uh, it's my honor to participate and be with Dr. Sarah, Dr. Ziad, and Dr. Abdullah. As you said, it's music to our ears, what we hear some of the messages from the three speakers. Um, again, on behalf of Pharmaceutical Research and Manufacturers of America Pharma and our members in Saudi Arabia, we, we thank you for the opportunity to meet and discuss how can we work together to strengthen Saudi's biotech sector. Um, as you know, Pharma represents the leading innovative biopharmaceutical companies. Uh, these companies, as you have witnessed over the last year and a half, are on the fourth front lines and led the way to the development of vaccines and therapeutics to help the world emerge, emerge from COVID-19 and return our lives to a sense of normality, which I hope soon. Uh, these companies are also substantial investors in the kingdom. And, you know, Dr. Sarah gave some examples on that, where they are employing Saudis, bringing innovative solutions to the nation's healthcare challenges. We fully appreciate the importance placed on the life sciences sector by Vision 2030. Achieving this vision will require a holistic approach to policy making and the creation of synergies between healthcare regulations and industrial policy. A strong partnership between the government and the private sector is of vital importance. Our key priority in the whole region in Middle East and Africa and particularly in the kingdom, as one of our key priority countries, is to ensure that we work with governments on the, some of these key public policies that are conducive to improving access to innovative medicines and to the development of an ecosystem that value and encourage innovation. The global economy is fundamentally different from 20 to 30 years ago. Capital talent capital, talent, information, all flow more or less freely across the world. So the world is becoming more competitive and a lot of countries are looking to the same thing about the, you know, attracting clinical trials, attracting research and development. So, so Saudi Arabia is today 
is competing against other countries in attracting investment by the innovative biopharmaceutical industry. Research and international case studies suggest that encouraging high tech sectors to grow requires an enabling environment based on key structural macro components such as R&D, R &D, infrastructure, human capital, and right public policies. Mandatory localization policies, for example, in some of the countries are not effective in encouraging biopharmaceutical innovation, but creating an enabling environment works better. We have identified several enabling factors from our experience around the world um, that are critical for encouraging biopharmaceutical and biotechnological innovation. Some of these enabling factors, you know, human capital, I mean, we talked about, it was mentioned, human capital, and I believe Saudi Arabia um, have great talent in this regard. Uh, infrastructure for R&D, R&D infrastructure and capacity is critical. And I think Saudi is moving in building this infrastructure for R&D. IP protection, and Dr. Sara mentioned that, uh, patents and regulatory data protection are of real importance to biotech and biopharmaceutical innovation. Incentive, it, it incentivizes and uh, support R&D of new technologies and products. You know, without R&D, there is no biopharmaceutical industry. A regulatory environment, when you look at the incentives in a country that attract uh, the bio-innovative pharmaceutical industry, there are several incentives, but when we look at pricing and reimbursement are key important incentive for the pharmaceutical industry. Pricing that reward innovation. Um, and uh, of course, the last and um, very important aspect is the legal certainty. Uh, the general legal environment, including as it relates to the rule of law. You know, I, I just emphasize here again on protecting IP, particularly important for high tech sectors, including, uh, including biopharma. Uh, uh, although Vision 30, 2030 places some emphasis on local manufacturing for variety of sect sectors, which is truly an important point. However, for the innovative biopharmaceutical industry, the largest and key investment is in R&D, including clinical trials as increased investment in R&D will result in economic growth based on knowledge and innovation, which is also Vision's 2030's objective to transform the kingdom into a knowledge-based economy. Uh, and when we look at in-depth analysis, but I heard what Dr. Abdullah was saying about some of the changes that's being done for the guidelines and the approval processes, which is really important. But when we look at currently the uh, analysis of the clinical research activity in, in Saudi Arabia through the number of clinical trials, uh, Saudi Arabia so far has not attracted appropriate portion of global clinical trials that is aligned with its size and importance. And this is really key importance. And we, we always are ready to work our companies and pharma and others to work with Saudi Arabia to enhance that. Majority of trials carried out in Saudi Arabia so far, to my knowledge, are late, later stage, later phase trials, not cutting edge phase one or two trials. There is an opportunity to attract even more investment, uh, specifically in early state clinical trials and R&D efforts, which can provide both health and economic benefits. These benefits align with the kingdom's goal as set forth in the Saudi 2030 vision and the National Transformation Program 2020 to improve the quality of healthcare and, facility, and facilities while increasing the share of contributions from the private sectors, including foreign investors. Um, so Saudi Arabia has a clear and defined aspiration for being competitive in biopharma and vision 2030, as I mentioned, is a fundamental roadmap for achieving success. Some key challenge, policy challenges still persist in, the, in Saudi Arabia. At this moment, you know, the biopharmaceutical industry still face, face key challenges in IP protection, mainly in data 
exclusivity. And we are working with, uh, uh, with, of course, with Dr. Sara, with SFDA, and with SAIB to resolve these issues. We would like always to express our continued readiness to partner with the government uh, in Saudi Arabia to help achieve its aspirations uh, of a promising future through improving access of Saudi patients to innovative, high quality treatments and care. And second, creating an environment which could foster a biopharmaceutical sector in Saudi Arabia that is globally competitive in attracting investment uh, job creation and technology transfer. I thank you very much. And, uh, you know, again, Steve, thank you very much for the opportunity. Well, Samir, thank you. And, and uh, kudos, you covered a lot of ground. And I think, uh, again, uh, it did a very nice job in representing uh, the, the, the points for industry. And uh, let me next uh, pivot to uh, Ashraf. Um, we'll, Ashraf, we'll turn the floor over to you. And again, thank you for your leadership and again, sponsoring the series and Ashraf, the floor is yours. Thanks, thanks Steve um, and the, the US Chamber of Commerce for organizing this series of uh, event, which is really appreciated to increase the partnership uh, between the, the investor, the, the pharma industry and our governmental bots. A uh, big thank you as well to uh, Dr. Sara, Dr. Ziad, uh, Dr. Abdullah, Dr. Samir, for your uh, inspiring speech uh, we started with. And um, uh, my focus today will be just to give you uh, a flavor about the uh, pharma um, industry and the, the uh, pharma association in Saudi under the name of the RPCC, which is the research-based uh, uh, companies uh, committee. Uh, we are a group of almost uh, 22 um, multinational company who is driving the innovative um, new medication to the globe. And it's a pleasure uh, to be in, in Saudi and to increase the investment in Saudi and to ensure that uh, we have a full access to the most new innov innovative uh, products and solution we are providing globally to the uh, patient or our patient in um, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. But that's why I would say that uh, today the, the focus will be that how to enhance the and uh, catch the opportunities uh, for more investment and to attract the investor to invest more in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And I believe that that's fully aligned with uh, our vision uh, 2030. But that's why uh, there lots, definitely there is lots of uh, ways to increase the investment in, in Saudi Arabia. But I'm going to highlight and focus on the uh, opportunities we are looking for as an investor in this uh, industry, which I believe that it's very important because it's touching our patient. And definitely we need to ensure that we are providing our patient with the most innovative uh, uh, solution and treatment for the most complex uh, disease and definitely saves the travel for our patient, Saudi patient, to go out of Saudi to reach to these innovative uh, products. But that's why increasing the investment in, in, in Saudi when it comes to bring those new innovative assets and medication, it's crucial. Uh, and I believe that we all agree on this, that the, the rights of the patient to have an access for these innovative uh, products. But definitely, as we, uh, uh, I, I would assume that we are, we're gonna agree that the investor to increase uh, and focus on more investment uh, in, in Saudi, as Samir mentioned, that we need to have uh, or update the, uh, the platform of the investment to ensure that we are encouraging and attracting more uh, investor to the kingdom of uh, Saudi Arabia that definitely will require uh, to have um, uh, the major uh, elements for increasing the investment is the predictability and sustainability of, of the business. But that's we're gonna be a direct link um, with the, um, as we always discuss with the intellectual property, uh, property rights and the regulatory data protection uh, uh, rights, as well as the um, regulation of the compulsory license. Uh, frankly speaking, we're very happy and excited as an investor with the clear partnership 
the uh, which we consider a real part, uh, partnership with the governmental bodies uh, with the open transparent communication with the uh, dialogues we have it uh, whenever uh, needed and as well as with the workshops uh, we have it regularly but that's definitely one of the major and important um, uh, platform we need definitely to increase to ensure that we have this open communication we ensure that the needs of the investor is will be fully satisfied uh, with the governmental bits. Big thank you to Dr. Asara because frankly speaking, she's always available to hear from us, from the industry, from the pharma association in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And we have such a platform as a connection with all the governmental bits. This is definitely a very encouraging uh, uh, for us and give us the trust and the confidence uh, to encourage our headquarters, uh, wherever it is uh, around the globe, to ensure that we bring this um, investment into the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. We have done great, I believe, achievement partnership when it comes to the Saudization, working with the Ministry of, of Labor, and we are fully uh, investing big time in developing the talent, the Saudi citizen talent, to ensure that we're going to have the future leader all coming from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Yes, it's going to take time to ensure that we are building these capabilities in a very confident way, but we fully agreed and aligned that definitely this transformation phase we are all committed to, to ensure that the next and the future leaders, we will be all a Saudi citizen and to have this handover in the industry in a very solid manner to ensure that when we have this handover, we have the very uh, amazing leaders, uh, Saudi citizens, to lead this pharma uh, industry successfully and to increase more and more the investment in Saudi Arabia. Uh, as well as when it comes to the difficult time during the pandemic and the, uh, um, the uh, pandemic of COVID-19, I believe that all of us, we show a great partnership from when it comes to the supply of our uh, uh, products and brand service as well uh, to the kingdom to ensure that we don't have any challenges in the supply for our patient. But always we put the patient in Saudi in our focus, in our heart. That's why all of the multinationals working in Saudi and on behalf of them, we have done a great job to ensure that we're giving a priority for the kingdom of Saudi Arabia when it comes to supply. That's, I would say, that a great example. And when it comes to the lockdown period, if you remember well, a year from now, lots of initiatives came uh, from, again, partnership from the multinational company uh, in the pharma industry in Saudi to go and to do the home delivery to the patient at home to ensure that we don't have any lack of the supply for our patient. Um, when it comes to the um, uh, second point uh, um, after the intellectual property rights, and big thank you uh, again to um, uh, the Ministry of Investment, uh, uh, Dr. Sara, and her, uh, her effort with the Saudi FDA and with SAIB, as well as an organizations, with all the collaborative work to ensure that we're going to advance the mechanism uh, we have it in the kingdom to ensure that we have protecting and respecting the full right of the investor. This is definitely will encourage the more and more investment uh, uh, to Saudi because we understand that the rights for these intellectual properties, the regulatory data protection is fully uh, protected. As well as that, the great partnership we have it for now for, uh, for developing uh, the HTA. Yes, it's just started in, in Saudi, but definitely we are providing the best practice from wherever across the globe to ensure that uh, we are providing the best platform to build the HTA uh, in the proper manner. Um, definitely I need just to ensure that the full collaboration with the Ministry of Industry when it comes to the localization, as well as uh, uh, the um, Ministry of Labor and NOPCO, this is a great partnership from, uh, uh, from all these governmental bodies with uh, the Pharma Association in Saudi Arabia. I'm quite sure that we're going to uh, continue building on a, a fair pricing um, strategy as well to ensure that uh, the pricing platform 
will be like a win-win situation for the investor and for the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia as well. Definitely, uh, we'll continue uh, our partnership. I'm very happy with this and we are all very excited to maximize this partnership and to reach to a very successful platform reaching to our vision of 2030. Thank you so much and back to you, uh, Steve. Thank you, Ashraf. And again, and uh, thank you for your leadership there uh, on the RPCC and uh, all the efforts. Um, I would say if there's been one big takeaway, it's been that there is a robust uh, collaboration and, and discussion between industry uh, and the Saudi government um, across a lot of different uh, uh, entities. So we, we appreciate that. And, and, and I think our hope our friends in government know that we appreciate the open door uh, because that's not always the case. And we're grateful for that and look forward to continuing that and even thinking more creatively about how we can doing how we can uh, build on that. Um, but at this time, we'd love to uh, open it up uh, to all the participants. I know we had one question in the chat room, uh, which Dr. Sir, I'll, I'll, I'll throw that one to you. Um, it is more of a, a procedural question. Uh, how, how can somebody uh, bid on uh, bid on a healthcare project there in the kingdom? Um, I know you're an investment, but I, uh, I would, uh, with, without going into all the details, uh, per, perhaps you can give some guidance on that. And then certainly to our panelists, uh, Dr. Sarah, uh, Dr. Uh, Ziad, and Dr. Abdullah, if you have any reaction to um, the, the comments that Samir and Ashraf um, offered, we'd welcome that as well. But Dr. Sarah, let me throw that first one to you. Uh, great, thanks, Steve. And uh, you know, it's lovely hearing the, the remarks from from my colleagues and from uh, uh, Dr. Ziad, Dr. Abdullah, Ashraf, and and uh, Samir. Thanks, thanks for that. And and thanks for all of the lovely shout outs. Um, I'm I'm glad that our work is is uh, you know attracting and gaining a lot of a lot of momentum because I think it's truly uh, uh, beneficial for the ecosystem. Um, I um, uh, with with respect to the question, uh, I'm I'm not sure exactly what is meant. Is this a is this a Nupco specific uh, procurement question or is this an investment opportunity question? What I'll do is I will just say that for. Um, uh, for procurement for, for healthcare projects and, and drugs and so on, we have uh, uh, a unified arm, a procurement agency that deals with, you know, the RFPs, the contracting, the purchasing, and so on. And that's, I guess, a separate discussion. In terms of um, investment opportunities uh, and um, being able to understand what those are, the different, you know, market analyses and 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 where to pitch in and how to pitch in. Uh, we have an, we have a platform that is called Invest Saudi, uh, and you can just Google that, and the platform will come up. Uh, and what this platform um, enables is that it allows all government entities, uh, including ourselves, to post uh, or upload different investment opportunities in different sectors along the value chains, as I mentioned, based on specific demand areas, based on unmet clinical needs, based on public health priorities, and so on and so forth. Um, and so what you can do is you can filter by sector and understand where you can, um, you know, strategically uh, invest in, in uh, uh, based on these priorities. And then there is, of course, a portal to reach out to the Invest Saudi team directly who will route you to the specific sectors and sector heads and, and take the conversation uh, along the investment life cycle from there. Um, so that's in terms of the, uh, uh, if, if that's what you were referring to, that's the Ministry of Investments answer. Um, but you know, just to, just to briefly comment and and you know have make sure that there's enough time for for the fellow panelists, I'll keep it very brief. I just want to say that we are. Uh, it sounds like, uh, and it has been sounding like for a while now that government and industry are in full alignment in terms of what the priorities need to be, uh, both from a regulatory perspective um, and from an investment opportunity perspective. And I think you know this is. The reflection of this that I see is in our very mature conversations that we have with leading biotechs around the world, from the startup level all the way to, like I said, large corporations and MNCs in, in this space, uh, where we are now actually having meaningful conversations about early stage trials, about you know R&D for cutting edge platform technologies, about vaccine localization, uh, you know multi modality uh, scale up manufacturing facilities. Uh, and all of the other things that I discussed, um, be it with Roche or with some of our other partners, uh, where we're looking into, again, 
the, the tangibles are important, but also the intangibles. Collaborating on, for example, co-developing uh, in, innovation incentive schemes, uh, policy reform, uh, data hubs, and so on and so forth. Um, so we are interested in, in all of the above. We understand that there's a lot of you know, trust and, and, and reform and infrastructure building that needs to take place until uh, you know, the, the, the opportunities are, uh, speak for themselves and, and investors come flocking in. And we are willing to, to put in the, the, the effort and the cooperation, the collaboration that is required to get to that stage. But I think it's nice that we are finally speaking the same language and our priorities are aligned. Uh, even, even about this point of, you know, focusing on R and D and innovation, uh, uh, and early research, you know, we have a really strong, uh, academic research community in the kingdom. Um, uh, you know, this, this means that there are a lot of barriers uh, uh, and difficulties when it comes to commercialization and the business dimensions of, of the sector. But it also means that there are strong academic research partners for industry to come and hybridize with and, and you know, utilize the human capital, the talent that, that Samir was referring to, the infrastructure that, that was mentioned also, core laboratory functions, the publication records, you know, we have brilliant scientists, brilliant facilities, and this will enable know-how transfer, joint IP. Uh, it will push people to to a different edge in terms of uh, where we've where we've been and where we want to be in in the biotech landscape and ecosystem. So this all sounds really promising, and and um, it sounds like we are speaking the same language. Thank you, Dr. Sarah, and I know we'll want to continue to work closely with you on those areas that you identified from your IP initiative uh, to everything around your clinical trials business model and then the data governance. And we actually work very closely with Sadia and, and the other entities uh, on big picture data, uh, but particularly uh, the healthcare is a very interesting dynamic. And I think we'll be talking about that in our third session. I did wanna go, uh, uh, Dr. Ziad and Dr. Uh, Abdullah, if you had any uh, hearing from Samir and Ashraf, uh, if you had any uh, kind of reaction to comments, you know, from their perspective on things that they might have raised. Um, Dr. Zia, let me let me go to you first, and then uh, Dr. Abdullah. And then I did want to, I, I want to, before we close out, maybe go to Ahmed at Roche. I know uh, you've been invoked a couple times, you're on camera, I see, so we might turn to you for any any thoughts you might have. But Dr. Zia, let me go to you, uh, we'll go to you first for any thoughts you might have in reacting. Um, no, I, I think uh, there, there are a lot of areas for collaboration. And I think uh, in the area of public health, uh, public health interventions, uh, I'm sure uh, Dr. Sarah has alluded to a lot of opportunities uh, uh, included in the Vision 2030. Um, you know, I think when it comes to uh, uh, managing crowds or dealing with uh, COVID outbreaks, uh, you know, diagnostics, therapeutics, uh, vaccine, uh, I know in, in, um, in the, uh, committee that uh, I'm working with uh, regarding the procurement of, of supplies for the uh, for the COVID management. This has been a, a huge challenge for the country, similar to all the other countries have been uh, going through, uh, trying to secure the, the adequate supplies and, and vaccines and, and uh, including ventilators and, and so on and so forth. Uh, so I think uh, it speaks of uh, the need for countries to to start developing their own infrastructure for uh, for manufacturing and also developing uh, these items in-house uh, in the country. So I think this is a great time for collaboration. I'm, I'm happy to see Dr. Sara and, and the Ministry of Investment uh, working very hard on trying to sort of uh, uh, localize a lot of the uh, you know effort of manufacturing uh, equipment, supplies, drugs, and and uh, you know and and the support of Dr. Abdullah. And, in, uh, in getting clinical trials uh, on board. Um, it's unfortunate that, you know, with all the vaccines that have been uh, released so far or, or under development, uh, the kingdom has not been able to participate in any of the clinical trials for vaccine development for COVID. And, and the reasons are, you know, exactly what Dr. Abdullah has mentioned, is, is, the, is the process is too complex, uh, it's too fragmented. And, uh, you know, I'm excited to hear that uh, Dr. Abdullah and his team at the NIH will be handling this uh, in the future so that the process is much smoother and, and uh, the scientists uh, can benefit as well as the academicians and in addition the country will benefit uh, by having some of these vaccines and, and new medication trialed on, on, on our own patients uh, in the country. 
uh, over to Dr. Abdullah. Thank you, Dr. Zia. Yes, uh, Dr. Abdullah, we'd, we'd love to hear from you. You know, any thoughts having heard, you know, Samir and I'll speak to uh, research and clinical trials and kind of the path forward uh, between Saudi NIH and the Saudi government and industry in this space. Thank you very much, Steve, for this opportunity. Thank you for the panelists, uh, Dr. Sara, for the invitation, Dr. Ziad, um, Sir Ashraf, and uh, Samir. Uh, well, uh, what I wanted to say is I'm thankful for the opportunity that we have some sort of unified point of view. We have a very clear target now, and uh, clarifying the target is halfway of uh, the journey. Uh, we have understand the, 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 the limitations that we have. We never uh, claim that we born mature, but uh, maturity is a long journey that we have actually uh, uh, indulging right now. Uh, we are proud of our colleagues from the pharma industry, from the uh, governance body, uh, including Dr. Sara, Dr. Ziad as well as the Saudi FDA and all the, 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 the people that works in, in different kind of the Saudi National Committee of Bioethics, as well as the hospital that would provide uh, the successing kind of uh, uh, tools for this initiatives. I just wanted to uh, uh, stress on that the fact that what I think what the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia is trying to achieve is not uh, a financial gain per se. Uh, they are trying to partnership for the bitterness of the, for, for making the healthcare better for the prosperity of the Saudi na nations and the people who's there. Well, if this means that <clears throat> get partnership with, uh, um, with the strong people would make that happen as well as, as a side effect, uh, impact the economy, then this is the, uh, uh, having uh, kind of uh, getting one bird with throwing one stone, which is good and bad, which is good and, and fine. Um, and we are open to that and uh, all our resources is open to that and all the, 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 the governing body is uh, uh, behind us and, and under the flag of both Dr. Ziad and Dr. Sara, Saudi FDA, National, Saudi National Committee of Bioethics and uh, Sadaya as well. So we're looking forward to the next chapter and we are sure that's going to be prosperous and uh, good. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Abdullah, very comprehensive again. Um, and uh, before we before we uh, close down, uh, uh, Ahmed Sabra from Roche. Uh, Roche has been mentioned a couple of times, again, not to put you on the spot, but I just want a, a, a perspective from, uh, participant in this call, I think you'll be joining as a panelist at one of our, our future sessions, but um, would love any reaction or comments or thoughts you might have. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Steve, for opening the opportunity and for the invitation and, and thanks for all the uh, speakers, great speeches, and for our colleagues as well, Samir and Dashaf, uh, for really representing us in, in this forum. Uh, what I can say is that where, where Sarah uh, finished her talk is the common language that we are speaking. And this is something that we sensed uh, since a couple of years when I joined here in the Saudi Arabia, that the, we as a pharmaceutical industry, uh, you will be more than happy if you see that the government are speaking the same language as you are thinking. So what we are looking for is uh, how we can shape and work on the healthcare ecosystem and how we can bring better value and impactful uh, innovation to the patients. And this is the concern of the government and this is part of the vision 2030 related to healthcare. And we can see that this is very uh, much on, the, on, their, on their priorities as well. Whenever we are discussing with the uh, stakeholders or with the health authorities, we feel that there is an acceptance on that level. We see that as some areas, for example, data governance and policies, uh, clinical trials, whatever, there are some kind of uh, uh, slow movements in that. But I guess that what, what the Ministry of Investment recently launched and how we are moving in that direction, I think that we will achieve what we want. I totally uh, hear what Dr. Abdullah said as well in that regard, and I think that we are on the right track. We can see that from infrastructure, Saudi is the best in terms of uh, uh, in the Middle East countries and even in the in the region probably more than the Middle East, we can see the appetite as well 
to to replicate some of the success that is happening in some of the European countries in terms of clinical trials or in the US, we can see excellent appetite as well for the using the artificial intelligence and data as well on how to drive efficiency in this in the healthcare system. So all of these things, I believe that they are great uh, uh, signs that we can, as a pharma industry, take it and, and take it forward and work with the health authorities here in Saudi Arabia. Uh, I, I'm, I'm very excited being at this stage in Saudi Arabia. Transformation is happening. And as well, we are taking it as part of our transformation as well as companies in terms of mindset and culture. So both of them, they are making an excellent synergy as well. And which uh, this is where, where we are really uh, motivated to be part of this uh, transformation in the healthcare system in Saudi Arabia. So that's it from my side. I'm looking forward for uh, uh, for the future interactions and thanks again for the U.S. Chamber of Commerce as well for uh, spotting the light on all the important matters in healthcare. And thanks a lot for Dr. Abdullah, Dr. Ziad, Dr. Sara, and for my colleagues Ashraf and Ziad. And Samir, sorry. Thank you, thank you, Abed. Uh, Sir, before we close out, um, uh, I just want to turn to you as uh, the the chamber partnering with the ministry for any any final comments you might have, and then uh, I'll just kind of bring it home. But I, I did want to give you uh, one one final opportunity for any uh, concluding thoughts. Sorry, you th you think that by now we've learned to unmute and mute very rapidly, but it's it's been a year and a half, and this is still an issue. Um, thanks, thanks so much, Steve, and, and thanks to your team, uh, and and thanks to all my my fel fel fellow panelists. Uh, I think you know this is uh, what was said and shared today is such a great kickoff to to the series that we've planned together, and I look forward to the uh, next couple of uh, sessions where we can deep dive into some topics that I think are, are of particular and pertinent interest to, to us as a government and to our industry partners. Um, um, but, I, but I also just wanted to say that, uh, again, to, to, to reiterate that we are um, very much in the business of ecosystem enhancement, understand the priorities of, of the industry because they are similar priorities to ours. We will keep um, all of our partners and, and you know, the chamber posted on developments that, that will occur hopefully in the coming months on the efforts that are near completion. I mentioned the Clinical Trials Coalition, the intellectual property policy recommendations that we have uh, raised to, to senior levels in government. Um, and hopefully, you know, we'll be able to celebrate uh, a true and concrete policy reform in these areas uh, uh, jointly very, very soon. Um, and I also want to say to, to our industry partners that we are uh, also very much in the business of listening. Uh, and uh, uh, we, we, we are always interested in understanding uh, your priorities, the areas that you're bullish on. The, the, you understand the, the market and, and the kingdom and our economy uh, as well as any of us do. And so going really beyond the surface of you know, Vision 2030 and Saudi as a G20 economy and really having those technical and intelligent conversations about, you know, why it makes sense to do clinical trials in a particular disease area, uh, why certain diagnostic tools are of value to the kingdom, uh, why certain, you know, research areas or, or uh, modalities of, 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 of treatment are, are, are of uh, unique value for, for the kingdom. And, and we're, what, we're, what we want to signal is that we are ready and willing and open to have these conversations uh, and to facilitate the most optimal investment journey and life cycle for you, uh, including all of the various uh, pillars that I that I described, in addition to uh, hopefully, as we continue to study this as part of our national investment strategy, packages of attractive incentives along the value chain. So I'll leave it at that and thank you so much. Well, Sarah, thank you. And if I may, uh, one last time, I just want to really thank uh, Dr. Ziad for, uh, for your, your comments and your remarks and sharing your slides. Uh, on all the work that's been done on mass gatherings and particularly now at this moment with COVID-19. And we look forward you know, to seeing what's kind of born uh, out of this experience and guidance and, and thought leadership going forward. Um, also, Dr. Abdullah, there at Saudi NIH, I know we're so excited to see uh, the progress being made in creating a more welcome environment 
uh, so that we can see more uh, clinical trials and research being done there in the kingdom. Um, of course, to, to uh, my partners in uh, industry, uh, Samir, I think hopefully as everybody knows, such a, a long history and great working relationship between the chamber and pharma. We look forward to continuing that. I think there's so much that we can do together uh, coming out of a call like this uh, in terms of follow-up, of course, in partnership uh, with Ashraf and the RPC see there in, uh, in Riyadh and continuing that work together uh, as industry. And of course, to uh, other sectors as well in, in med tech and health IT and diagnostics, uh, we, we look forward, uh, Sarah, to working with you and advancing you know, this, these policy reforms uh, with, the, with the intention of ultimately creating uh, a better health ecosystem for uh, the citizens of Saudi Arabia. So we're, we're excited about this and we really look forward to continuing to partner with the ministry in this webinar series. Uh, thanks to everybody for taking time out of your day uh, to be with us. Uh, we look forward to seeing you at the webinar number two on August 25th. And between now and then, if uh, as things arise, don't hesitate to reach out uh, to myself or my colleagues uh, here at the chamber. But thank you to all of our panelists and all of our speakers. And uh, with that, we will uh, conclude this session. Thank you very much.